Um, I'm the chair of the colloquium committee, and this is our final colloquium of the, of the year. It's been an adventurous year, full of lots of challenges and changes, but we've had great attendance, whether online or in person, or a bit of both. Is it okay? Yeah, and um, so I just wanted to sort of uh, say a few thank yous. Uh, the colloquium committee is uh, Jared Barron, uh, Dick Bond, uh, Zi Ching Hong, Sajeev John, Arun Paramakanti, Dick Pelche, John Wei, and myself. I'd also like to thank uh, Joanne Magni, who has uh, served as the coordinator for uh, all our administrative work, and also our AV help here, uh, Genesis uh, Hearn, Ahmed Ryan, um, and also Fatima Ejaz helped us uh, with getting the setup for these kind of uh, in-person uh, meetings as we, as we started. So I just want to thank everybody. It's been a big team effort. Um, lots of challenges, as I said. Uh, there was good response to our, our, our poll about the uh, timing of the colloquium, and you'll hear more about that to come. And uh, this, the committee is already thinking about next year. So I invite all your comments and feedbacks. Just send, send, send them along to me. I'd be happy to hear, hear from you. So without further ado, I will uh, pass the mic to Josh. Go ahead. Thanks, Paul. So uh, I'm really pleased to have Laura Waller. She's visiting us today from Berkeley, where she leads a computational imaging lab. Um, so Laura's work really is kind of showing where a lot of optics and imaging is going. And in, in, in the modern days, you have really moved beyond just lenses and so much of the improvements and how we're pushing this forward is actually through developing algorithms essentially to gain more information out of the data and to actually see things better, see bigger areas and really uh, uh, look at the world in, in greater detail. And so all these computational advances I think are, are, are kind of this next step forward. Uh, so Laura, um, she uh, is a Moore Foundation data-driven investigator, a Baker Fellow, uh, she got a Distinguished Graduate Student Mentoring Awardee. She's an NSF Career Awardee. She's a Chan Zuckerberg Biohub Investigator. She received a Spearley Career Achievement Award and is also a Packard Fellow. So that's pretty good. You're doing pretty good so far. Anyways, <laughs> so um, with that said, I'd like to uh, thank, uh, maybe we could thank Laura for coming out here and uh, I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. Great, thanks. <laughs> All right, and the whole point of in-person is it can be more interactive, so you're very welcome to interrupt, ask questions. I think some people here are maybe from a, a, like a diverse audience, like a little bit different than my background, so please interrupt me and ask me, what are you talking about? Or if I'm not being uh, clear enough about the basics, um, feel free to, to ask. There's probably others with the same questions. All right, so what I'm talking about is today is computational microscopy. Um, this is what my group works on, and it's part of this, uh, this genre of computational imaging, which is really a design concept. It's like a way of thinking about imaging system design, and the idea is that you should design your hardware and your software together. So if things are best done by the hardware, in our case it's optics usually, then you should do it with the optics. And if it's, if it's better to do it in the digital steps like after and post-processing, then do it there. And so rather than just trying to take the best images and then using post-processing to try to extract the most information from those images, we think about how to best encode the information in the measurements, which might not look anything like images at all, and then decode them through the algorithms. And one of the most exciting parts of computational imaging right now is what I'm calling data-driven design. And this is the idea that um, to do like the algorithm design, we kind of like we're trying to solve an inverse problem. So solve this equation for X. But for the hardware side, it's largely been, you know, sort of black magic or expertise built up over, over people learning like optical design skills and thinking of these ideas. But now we can start to think about using data-driven methods to uh, not only to solve the inverse problem, but also to design the imaging system hardware. And that's really possible because we now have things like big neural networks that can solve these super nonlinear, non convex problems reasonably well. So I'll get into that a little bit at the end. Uh, but here's a, a canonical example, and this is going to be a project that I'll talk about. This is a lensless camera. And basically, you take your camera, you remove the lens, and now it's just a sensor. Point the sensor at the world and take a picture. 
So the picture you take obviously looks like garbage um, because you didn't have the lens there to focus the light. But the lens's only job is to bend the light rays in a particular way. And so if I could computationally bend those light rays, then shouldn't I be able to take this image and computationally reconstruct my scene? It's the same light that would have hit the sensor whether I had the lens there or not. Uh, the answer is practically no. But this project, we call it diffuser cam because we put a diffuser in front of this sensor. So by diffuser, I just mean a bumpy piece of plastic. Like we sometimes use scotch tape or the stickers that you put on your windows so your neighbors can't see in. And you put this over the cover glass of the sensor. So it's just sitting a few millimeters away from the sensor. And now I take an image that also looks like garbage, but now it's structured garbage and I can reconstruct the scene from this image. And that's because the diffuser did something. It encoded the light in a very particular way that we were able to decode through our inverse problem solver. So uh, this is just one of many projects in the lab. I'm gonna get into some more details on it. Um, and I think it's a really nice example of how computational imaging can be useful. So if you think about a regular camera, you have some lenses, and if you have a point out in the world, it is imaged onto your sensor as a point. Uh, so we would call this the point spread function and optical designers would spend their lives trying to make this point as close to a delta function as possible. If we have one of these diffuser cams, it's just this bumpy piece of plastic uh, above the sensor. And so a point in the world, a point, the light spreads out by the time it gets to the diffuser, it goes through all these bumps. Then what we see on the sensor is this sort of a point spread function. It's huge, right? And so this is considered a bad imaging system because its point spread function is huge. But this is a structured, it's huge, but it's also very structured. And the randomness is actually a feature. Um, so it's kind of like randomly focused light. It looks like the bottom of a swimming pool on a hot day. Um, and this point spread function, I want to argue, is no worse than the previous one in lots of cases. And the benefits you get from it are that you have this really compact camera that is also cheap, so it's cheap and compact. And I'm gonna show you that it can do things that regular cameras can't do. Uh, so I had some awesome undergrads in the lab here who wrote a tutorial on building this at home with a Raspberry Pi sensor. These are the cheapest sensors that we can find with scotch tape on a Raspberry Pi sensor. And we open source our code and the instructions for doing it. You can build this at home if you want. It's a fun activity. Um, and I've had lots of people send me their terrible pictures from their homemade versions. I'll be very happy if any of you do that. Um, okay, so, okay, so a point in the world maps to this point spread function. It's just like the impulse function of the system. And then if I move that point in the world, what happens? Well, it's basically the same point spread function, but it's shifted. And that is by design because this diffuser is thin. It sort of, it, uh, you can call this like an infinite memory effect, or you can say it's in the Raman Nacht regime for diffraction. But basically, uh, this shift effect is really valuable because it means that um, the system is shift invariant in this case. If I turn on two points, I get the linear sum of the responses from each. So this is a linear system in intensity. That means I can write it as a linear matrix. So here I have the, uh, the measurement Y of the scene X is mapped, uh, is mapped by this A matrix. Basically, we call this the Ford model or the system model. Uh, and a regular camera, you're trying to make an A matrix that's as close as possible to the identity matrix as you can. With a computational camera, who cares if it's the identity matrix? As long as it's known and invertible, then I can solve this problem. Um, okay, so known and invertible is not that trivial. How do I know what this A matrix is? How do I know this Ford model? So I could go measure it, right? Like I could go point a point source in the world and just scan it through the whole entire scene and capture, basically capture one column of the A matrix at a time and fill in the whole thing. Um, so if that were like practical, this would have been done long before us, but it's not because typically you have like, say you have a megapixel sensor, you need to take a million calibration images. You need a precision stage to go around and point, put those point sources in the right place. And then you need to invert a million squared matrix. Um, I could model it if I knew the surface shape of the diffuser, but I don't want you to have to have an AFM at home to be able to build this on the weekend with your kids. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about machine learning it. That's also an option. But in practice, we're going to do a combination of all three of these. That's the most efficient. Um, and so basically, a big part of it relies on this shift varying effect. So if I have a point source in the world, as it moves laterally, this response of the system simply shifts. And so it's a shift invariant system. What does that mean about the matrix, that A matrix? It's a shift invariant system. So then the response is just a convolution. And so this A matrix is just the convolution matrix, meaning that every column of this A matrix is the same as all the other columns just shifted by a different amount. So there's no need to go and measure a million different calibration images. Let's just take one with a point source in the far field. So this we do by just putting your iPhone flashlight and holding it, holding it out away from the sensor. And then you take like this one calibration image and every other, every other column here in the A matrix is determined by that one. So actually this point spread function falls off the edge of the sensor. So there's a cropping effect as well. I'm just gonna pretend that's not true and call this a convolution, but it's not exactly a convolution, uh, but we can deal with that. So basically to solve the inverse problem, we simply need to do a deconvolution. Um, and deconvolution can be done really efficiently with FFTs in Fourier space by division in Fourier space. So we take our raw data, deconvolve it with that known point spread function that we measured, and we get our recovered scene. We're doing all this with ADMM and uh, we're using total variation regularization. Halide is a program that my colleague invented to make, your, make good use of your GPUs and uh, processors without being a parallel processing expert. Here's a prettier image. Um, and this is the, the problem that we're solving. So our measurement is Y, and we're trying to minimize the difference between Y and the current estimate of the scene put through the forward model, subject to some constraints. Those constraints are that there's no negative light. And here, this isn't really a constraint, so we can tune how, how strong this, this constraint is, but it's really a regularizer that's trying to like lead us towards sparser solutions. So this is up to you to decide. Most of the results I'm gonna show you use total variation sparsity, which means it's trying to choose the solution that has the most sparsity in the gradient of the image. Okay, so solving this kind of optimization problem is pretty standard. Use any optimization solver like FISTA or ADMM. And I would call this the physics-based way of solving or model-based way of solving this inverse problem. So you put in your measurement, solve an optimization problem based on a known, known physical model for the system that's baked into your A matrix, and then you get out your image. So uh, if you wanna sound cooler, you can say you're doing neural networks and just dump all these things into a neural network, give it a whole bunch of input output pairs and have it learn how to do this inverse problem solver. Um, so you can do this and we did do this. Uh, and there's a lot of trade-offs between these different ways of doing things. And I think like in, in computational imaging, it's become a really hot trend to insert neural networks into your, into your algorithms. And we spend a lot of time thinking about these trade-offs because there's a lot of benefits to using the old school physics-based way of solving things. It's very interpretable and robust, but then machine learning is also very powerful. You can get really fast recons, but they comes at a huge cost that if you need to do training data, which you didn't need to do before, um, that really makes you think about whether it's worth it to do that. And then of course, what do the results look like? Um, but what we wanted to do is get the best of both worlds. And we call this physics-based learning. It's the idea that we would like to insert the physics that's known and true, and then learn all of the other stuff or learn the deviations from the correct. Like, so if you make a physics approximation somewhere, you can use machine learning to get beyond that. Or if you, one of our biggest issues is that when we build the system, it's always a little bit misaligned or imperfect. And so we can use learning to try to figure out those imperfections because they're, they're sort of like creating a bias in your results. Um, and one of the big things about it is that essentially it amounts to designing a neural network whose architecture is set by the physics of the system. And so then your neural network is very efficient. It doesn't need a lot of training data. Um, and you can sort of like figure out what it's doing a little bit easier. I'm not gonna get into the details, but you're welcome to ask of how we set up these neural networks. But uh, I just wanna show some results. So ground truth, the physics-based way is slow and has artifacts. 
the pure deep learning based way is fast and has artifacts, but this hybrid way of putting them together um, gets the best quality images and it comes in a reasonable time that you could do this in real time at real time speeds. Um, so uh, now I'm just going to show you a video from this camera because I want to go into some some uh, extensions of this work and a lot of things that I've told you are like, oh, this is a really cheap and compact camera. And it was a super fun toy to have in the lab. It's a cool concept. It's a neat idea, but it's not a great camera. And you can see a lot of artifacts here. And that's why I like to show this video. Um, so, uh, I mean, this is probably not gonna replace your cell phone camera, which is already very compact and cheap um, anytime soon. I don't argue that you couldn't. I think all these artifacts are, you could deal with them. And we've only sort of just started this kind of thing. We're competing with cameras that have had decades of development by many, many people. Um, but that's not the direction we wanted to go in. We're doing research. And we wanted to look for things that these lensless cameras or computational cameras can do that other cameras cannot do. And one of those is 3D. So think about your regular camera. If, you're in, if your image is in focus on one plane, then that stuff is in focus. And everything else is out of focus. Uh, it's blurred. And so that blurring is a loss of information. You can't just computationally bring it back. And people most certainly have tried. Um, but if you think about a lensless camera like ours, what happens when I change the depth of that point source? It doesn't go out of focus. It doesn't blur. It just gives you a different response of the system. And actually that response is just a scaled version of the original one. So we know exactly what happens as you change your depth. You just get a different scaling of this point spread function. So that means we have a different response of the system for every position in 3D. And that response has uh, is sort of a good response in the sense that it has a lot of high spatial frequencies meaning we have a chance to recover with high resolution and we're not losing information the way that normal camera blur does. So uh, here's what we wanna do. So we wanna take a single 2D measurement and we want to solve for 3D now. So we know that we have like a forward model that's just scaling at different depths and then shifting when things move laterally. So we can map that into this giant A matrix, but now I'd like to solve for say a million pixels or a megapixel image at every depth plane for a hundred different depth planes. So now I'm trying to solve for a hundred times more things than I measured. Well, the shift invariance uh, effect, uh, this convolution approach basically fixes all of the calibration and computation problems because inverting this sort of, even pseudo inverting this sort of matrix would be insane for reasonable sized images as I discussed before. But it, now it's still very underdetermined. We have a lot less data than we're trying to reconstruct information. So how are we going to do that? Um, what I'm gonna use is compressed sensing. This is becoming a pretty well-established field now. Um, so if you take images, then you usually do compression. People know about image compression in post-processing. So you take your image and you try to represent it with less data without losing the essence or like the main, the information from the image. So uh, the question of compressed sensing is like, if I took a 10 megapixel image, but it only had one megapixel of, of information, then why can't I just capture one megapixel? Why am I wastefully capturing so much extra data? Um, and compressed sensing says that uh, you don't have to collect the 10 megapixels. You can, uh, you can collect only one megapixel and use these compressed sensing approaches to reconstruct the 10 megapixels. And, and that's because the image had some compression capability, meaning it was sparse in some way. Question? Uh, what are the benefits of ADMM over Wiener deconvolution? Um, yeah, so, well, Wiener deconvolution, I, sh I should probably have some results somewhere, but ADMM is just, gives nicer results. You can put regularizers into it. I think that's a big one. So for the 2D images I showed, um, you can use regularizers as like denoisers or de artifactors, and that makes a big difference in the image quality. Um, so you can also like play around with adaptive, like update, sort of like not having your noise destroy you as easily as with Wiener filters. But certainly you can do Wiener filtering if you have really good data with low noise. 
Um, any other questions? This is a good chance. All right, so I'm talking about compressed sensing and so this is the idea is that we're gonna take less data and then we're gonna solve this underdetermined problem. Um, and the reason why you can solve an underdetermined problem exactly is that you, you're inserting a sparsity prior. So you know that the solution is sparse. So you can prove that if you solve it this way, that, um, and the solution is sparse and you're gonna get the right answer. So here's an example that our system is amenable to this. So we have a raw image, a reconstruction, and I'm going to simply delete 80% of the pixels. So take the raw image and delete 80% of those, randomly choose 80% of the pixels and just get rid of them. And from the 20% that is left, I can still reconstruct the image fairly nicely, even with 10% or even 2% of the data is enough to figure out what's going on in the image. Um, and the reason why we can do this in this system is because it does multiplexing. And by multiplexing, I mean a point in the scene maps to a lot of pixels on the sensor. And so, uh, so when you delete some of the pixels on the sensor, you still have information about that point in the scene. Um, okay, so you would never take a 2D image and then delete pixels from it. But what we are actually going to use it for is to take the 2D image and reconstruct the third dimension from it. So we take a single 2D image here and then reconstruct 3D. And this is the 3D reconstruction of this little leaf and it's spinning. So you get a sense of the 3D information. Um, and I say 128 times more voxels for free because we, we reconstruct 128 depth planes at full resolution um, and to get this image. Okay. So I think this is really exciting, particularly for microscopy because in microscopy, when you want to do 3D imaging of large volumes, you basically have to trade time. So you're, if you point scan, for example, like a confocal microscope will scan a point through all positions in 3D. Then if you want to do high resolution across a big volume, that means you need to image more voxels. And the more voxels you need to image, the longer you need to take to capture. So you can't really do like live biological imaging with this kind of thing. When we talk about a compressed sensing system, it really like the time is gonna scale with the sparsity. So if your sample is just, you know, a few beads floating around in dark space or like a little organism that's swimming around a big volume, then you can get away with having very high resolution across a very big volume uh, without capturing a lot of data. Okay, so if you think about like confocal or structure illumination microscopy light sheet, um, light field was like the original single shot 3D method for microscopy that people got really excited that you can take um, a single image and then reconstruct 3D information from it. Uh, but the way they achieved the, the 3D was by drastically cutting the lateral resolution. And so in photography, that was sort of uh, a better trade-off than in microscopy where the whole point is to get higher resolution. So people just aren't willing to give up that resolution by factors of 10 or more the way you would have to. Um, so uh, this diffuser cam idea is always single shot. So it's always like high speed. It's whatever speed your camera is. But the, uh, the, the number of voxels you can reconstruct, which is called the space bandwidth product, is, depends on how sparse the sample is. And so you, you can play this game of trying to get, a, get more for free. Okay, so one of the big applications we've been pursuing on this is neural activity tracking. And uh, I work really closely with Hillel Desnick's lab in neuroscience. They study mice. And the idea was that this camera is compact and lightweight, meaning we can, we can head mount it on these mice so they can run around a maze and we can watch which neurons are firing at which times. And we can design it to have single neuron resolution. Uh, it's also, we haven't done it, but you could take these, it, since it's just a sensor, you could take these microscopes and just tile them and put a whole bunch of them together to get at larger areas or larger volumes. Um, which I think could be really exciting. And it's something you just can't do with a regular microscope where you have a huge objective lens that's much larger than your sensing area. So uh, this is a slightly different system, but this is kind of like the idea of what we're trying to get at. This is a zebrafish. And here you can see the two side lobes of the zebrafish's brain. And so we're, we're plotting each point is the 3D position of a particular like neural thing. Uh, and the colors over time represent its activity, that neuron's activity over time. 
the zebrafish isn't doing anything exciting. So Hillel's lab uh, now works on like doing real experiments where, you know, they show it a video of some stripes moving and see which neurons fire. Um, this is just showing the, the technology. So we built it all into this flat cam version where you have just the sensor with a diffuser on top. We're doing fluorescence here. So the neural activity tracking, when the neuron fires, it fluoresces with a particular color. And so we need some fluorescence filters in there, which were actually kind of complicated physically to get into this compact package. But now you can see the zebrafish, you can see individual neurons firing over time. Okay, the last example, this is a water bear, and this is on a head-mounted mini scope version of our diffuser cam. So you see the raw data here, and then each frame is used to reconstruct a 3D, uh, 3D map of where this, these things are like naturally, or designed to be fluorescent. It's like a little caterpillar. You can see its legs there in a couple different views. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit more about the details of this, which I think is the most exciting part in the computational imaging world is that we started out with this opportunistic imager. So we grabbed a diffuser off the shelf or you use scotch tape or privacy glass sticker. And we got these like random PSFs and the randomness is essential for the compressed sensing. The distributed nature of the point spread function is essential for doing compressed sensing. Uh, but the problem with this is that all these areas in between all the random lines are like sort of like background light that make, washes out the whole image, especially when you have an extended scene. So piling all of the light into one spot is actually the ideal uh, point spread function in terms of SNR, but you can't do any compressed sensing with this. And when you go off focus, uh, this lens creates a big, a big blob, which is a terrible point spread function for deconvolving. Um, so, okay, so then you could use an array of lenslets, like uh, an array of microlens arrays, uh, a microlens array. The, this would actually be called Fourier light field microscope. Um, and the problem with this is that when I shift that point source in the space, in the, in the image space, then what happens is you get the point spread function shifts. And when it shifts by a certain amount, it's essentially almost the same point spread function as originally. So you get this periodicity uh, basically like these two points are kind of ambiguous because they have almost the same response of the system. So this is bad. Uh, and in Fourier light field microscopy, they just said, we're just gonna only use this large of a field of view, whereas we wanna use the whole field of view. So what we basically came out with is randomly spaced microlenses. So the randomness enables like avoiding this degeneracy. Um, and these microlenses will all have different focal lengths that are randomly distributed within the, the range of depths that you care about. Um, and this seems to be like a good, a good heuristic design, uh, but actually, is it the best design? That was sort of our question. And we've already showed that you can use machine learning to design the, like, the best inverse problem uh, or the best priors, uh, but now let's optimize the best data to, to capture. And by that, I mean, let's design the best diffuser. So we think this random microlens is, is a good one, but we can actually take a more uh, principled approach to designing this diffuser by putting it into this end-to-end -end learning framework. You see like all these references are examples of end-to-end -end learning and computational imaging. They're all fairly new because I think the compute just became sort of good enough to do these kinds of things. So in our case, we're trying to learn the diffuser surface shape and you're seeing the iterations of this learning uh, uh, of it learning the best diffuser for this particular example, which is just some randomly placed point sources in 3D. And it comes out with about eight or so micro lenses uh, that are in random-ish placements and their focal lengths will be random-ish. But it's interesting to see its progression, how it's, how's it's going about figuring out uh, what's the best diffuser there. Okay, so I still have some time. Uh, and I wanted to go into one other project that's perhaps uh, it's older project, um, but it might be useful in some real world situations, people doing imaging. Um, and it's a great example of computational imaging. So this is our, we call it the LED array microscope. We copied the original design from a group at Caltech. It's basically just a regular bright field microscope where there's one hardware change. The illumination has been replaced with this uh, LED array. We use much fancier arrays now, but Adafruit is literally a kid's toy company. So again, this is cheap and easy to build at home. This thing is just sitting above the sample. So 
the LED array is just a five centimeters or so above the sample. And as you turn on different LEDs, you're illuminating the sample from different directions. So we're patterning the illumination angles. So the, the sample always sees flat homogeneous illumination, but we're patterning its angles by turning on different LEDs. And I wanna show that by turning on different LEDs, we can get all kinds of different microscope modalities. So uh, first we can just turn on the center LEDs, we get a bright field image. If we turn on LEDs that illuminate from angles beyond the numerical aperture of the microscope, then we get dark field images. If we turn on half those central LEDs, we get phase contrast images. And uh, if anyone's worked in, uh, in microscopy, these are probably the three most popular non-fluorescent uh, microscope modalities. Now we can really easily swap between them without any extra hardware or um, expensive, uh, expensive changes to your objectives. Or you can time interleave them and take those videos. Um, so you can also get quantitative phase just by taking those two circles. Um, and then we can start to see things, subcellular features across pretty big areas. And this is now quantitative phase, which is a map of the uh, optical density and shape of the cell. The optical density is almost always the same as physical density. Okay, so then uh, one super cool thing that this can do is uh, sometimes called Fourier typography. I'm gonna call it gigapixel imaging. And it's going after the problem uh, of any imaging system where you wanna have a big field of view, but you also wanna be able to see things with high resolution. So um, just like regular cameras, microscopes have to choose. Zoom out and get a big field of view, bad resolution, or zoom in and get a small field of view, good resolution. And we want both. And this is a way of circumventing um, the diffraction limit in order to take a low resolution microscope and get higher resolution out of it by taking a bunch of images and computationally stitching them together. So we take this low resolution, low NA microscope, and it has a large field of view, but we simply cannot resolve the smallest features because of the diffraction limit associated with this low NA uh, objective. So then I flash my, my illuminations that I showed you that disco pattern. And then from this video, I can reconstruct the higher resolution image. I think this is seven times higher resolution in each dimension. Uh, and in principle, you could go even further than that. Um, okay, so for people who don't know Fourier optics, I need to talk a little bit about Fourier space. And a microscope actually does two Fourier transforms. You have your object here and your objective, if it's placed a focal length away from the object or your sample, then a focal length from there, you'll get the Fourier transform of the object. Uh, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I remember when I learned this and it blew my mind. But then the tube lens of your microscope also is placed like a focal length on either side such that it does another Fourier transform. And what does two Fourier transforms do? Yes, yeah, somebody's doing this. Yeah, it takes you back exactly where you started. So if you do the Fourier transform and you do another Fourier transform, you get back the original but flipped. So the axes get flipped. Who cares? Turn your sensor upside down and you won't even notice. Um, and so I did all of that so that I can talk about Fourier space. So now this is the Fourier space of the sample. UX, UY are the spatial Fourier, Fourier frequencies of the sample. And the numerical aperture of your objective defines how many spatial frequencies pass through the image, through the, through the imaging system. Um, so numerical aperture is all about the range of angles that your imaging system passes. Angles are the same as spatial frequencies. And so basically this is, a, this is just telling you which spatial frequencies pass through the system. A low NA objective doesn't pass a lot. So it has a small bandwidth in Fourier space and the images are low resolution. But when I illuminate from off axis, what happens? I'm, I'm multiplying the sample with the illumination Illumination is a tilted plane wave. So that's a phase ramp. Phase ramp in Fourier space, this is a shift. So uh, if you shift things in Fourier space, basically what we capture at the image plane then is a bunch of spatial frequencies that come from the same size circle. So it's still a low resolution image, but it's spatial frequencies beyond the original like bandwidth of the original system. So it lights up all these sub-resolution features. In this case, it lights up all the vertical features. And if I turn on this LED, I light up all the horizontal features. So these 
images that I'm capturing with different illumination contain all of that sub-resolution information. And so if I want to get all of it together, I can go turn on one LED at a time and collect information from all these little circles one at a time, fill in this very large circle that has a big bandwidth. And now I should be able to get higher resolution because I have this bigger bandwidth. This is called synthetic aperture. It's used all the time in radar. Uh, however, I'm basically stitching all these images together in the Fourier space. But if I do that, then I need to take an inverse Fourier transform to get the high resolution image back. And I can't do an inverse Fourier transform without phase information. So the fact that I was only collecting intensity information at my sensor, I only see the energy or like the absolute value squared of the complex field means that I can't do this yet. So I need to do this synthetic aperture plus a phase retrieval. So I, I need to recover the phase of this X in order to be able to do this inverse Fourier transform. So these, these circles are all overlapping and that overlap allows us to solve for the phase and do this uh, Fourier space stitching. So we can write all of this as a gigantic optimization problem, solve for the Fourier uh, complex field. Uh, we actually solve for this P, which is the pupil function. This, is, this represents the wavefront aberrations in the pupil plane or Fourier space. Um, and they're pretty important to get rid of. So we digitally remove aberrations in the process because it's kind of free to do so. So uh, this is phase imaging. And this is really important in biology because typically cells don't absorb any light. And so their amplitude images just are, they're transparent. And so you can't see the cells in amplitude only images. So intensity is just amplitude squared. Whereas if you can measure the quantitative phase, you can get a nice map of the morphology and the density. Um, so this has to be computational imaging because we can't measure phase directly. We can only measure intensity. And now you can work on samples that are non-standard non tagged, which is really important for live cell biology. Okay, so how we solve that inverse problem matters. Uh, I'm not gonna get, I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm not gonna get into it too much, but, um, the typical way of doing it is with gradient descent, or it's sometimes called Gertzberg Saxton. And uh, if you try to limit how much data you capture so you don't have an excessive amount of data, it really starts to run into problems. Um, this gets weird artifacts. If you use second order optimization, you can get a much better uh, result from the same data input data set. Uh, it takes a lot longer, um, but we don't actually know why. So this is a non-convex problem that we're solving with convex optimization. That only works because of that overlap between the circles. Um, but there's not really a good reason to explain why second order optimization methods work better than first order optimization methods, uh, except for this video about speed versus accuracy. Um, so I said this is 100 seconds, but this is only a 200 by 200 pixel patch of the image. And we need to do all these patches independently, reconstruct the higher resolution thing, and then stitch them all back together for like our gigapixel final results. Let me show you later that we're gonna do all that like on videos. So 100 seconds was like just excessive. So we went after like best of both worlds type thing of going for uh, fast enough and high quality by doing quasi second order methods. So instead of taking the first derivative and the second derivative, uh, in order to update your, to derive your cross function, we're just gonna use like the, the diagonal of that Hessian matrix of the second order. And that works really well. Okay, so now we're getting to a world where uh, we can take these high resolution images across a big area, but we have to take time to do them. And so if you think about like how long, say you have a hundred frames per second camera, how many images can I take before the thing has moved so much and there's motion blur that it wasn't worth getting this higher resolution anyways. Um, so you can't do this on all samples. If your samples are slow moving, then you can, uh, but you need to consider time in this uh, if you have live samples. Um, and I just wanna get into some of the ideas that we thought about, about trying to speed up the capture process. So I said these, these, pupil, these circles have to overlap. So, we have to take more data than we're reconstructing. It's the opposite of compressed sensing. Well, so they have to overlap, but because they overlap, we're taking 10 times more data than, than we're like reconstructing. Um, so that's a waste of time, but you can't just get rid of them. So our approach originally was to say like, okay, we're gonna take these half circles of the bright field. That gets us twice the resolution with only three images. So that's good value. And then in the dark field, 
we're going to turn on eight LEDs at once, and then a different eight, and then a different eight, until we fill in the whole area. That's what this disco pattern that I showed you earlier was. And that fills in the Fourier space eight times faster, plus every image is eight times brighter. So we get a, a very big increase in how fast we can capture this. Um, and this eight, it seems to be a kind of a magic number of the inverse problem still works. If we try to do 10, it's iffy. Uh, if we do less than eight, it will definitely work. Um, and I think that speaks to like, we had 10X extra data. So now we're reducing it by a factor of eight and it still works because we saw some buffer there for getting the algorithm to work. So here's our heuristic that I just showed you, but we can also do this end-to-end -end machine learning approach to try to use physics-based learning to find the best LED patterns to display. So say you have eight images that you're going to take. This is what images, what uh, LED patterns we would have used originally. And this is what our neural network told us we should use. And that works better. So this is kind of like ground truth, the full set of measurements. And if I reduce the number of measurements to 10, my heuristic approach starts to fail, but this data-driven approach does pretty well. And so now we can get away with taking a lot fewer images. Um, and then we're getting into stuff where we can look at live cell biology across a big area and still see things. So this is the cell's gonna divide. So you can see it's splitting there, curl up in a ball, and then it splits into four or five cells. And this is the field of view we would have had if we had a, a microscope with this resolution. Um, but actually we get this whole much larger field of view at that resolution because we're using this method. Uh, we can segment all of this stuff, sort of do quantitative approaches to it because it's quantitative phase information. And then I'm going to almost run out of time, but I guess I'll tell you a few of the dark secrets here. So this is actually my favorite part that you think this all works great, but there's problems. <laughs> and I want to talk a little bit about what our typical problems are. Um, so if you think about the diffuser cam approach, we use compressed sensing, which seems like magic, right? You get more for less. But uh, when you make your system really efficient in that way, so you're taking the most efficient data, then you are also becoming very fragile. That if your data has errors, they can cause big problems because you don't have extra redundancy built in to, to make up for it or to like vote it away. So, um, so we build these systems like thinking that we know this A, so this A matrix we think we're baking it into our algorithm a lot of the time. And so we should know it. We think we do. We designed the system. We built it. We know the physics. But in re reality, we spend a lot of time doing calibration. That if those LEDs say that they're coming in at 45 degrees, but it's actually 45.2, it can cause real problems. And so we spend half of our life trying to get it exactly to the right angles. Um, and I argue that a huge theme of our lab is to try to make these systems replicable so that you can build it in your lab or use it at home and without too much trouble. And if the whole theory all is beautiful, but you can't you know, put the duct tape in the right way to hold up that LED array at the proper angle and you don't know only one postdoc in the world can align the system, it's not very useful in practice. And so uh, we wanted to go after like, ways of doing calibration that don't involve an expert postdoc. Um, and so in this particular example of the LED array, the problems that we ran into were aberrations in the image. Usually that's not because the LED array wasn't perfect. It's because the sample would be like floating in water and then the water surface would refract the light to a different angle. And we need to account for that or we're gonna get problems. So sample induced problems. And here's basically like if we didn't calibrate our digitally calibrate our images. This is what we would look like. It totally defeats the purpose of getting higher resolution if you don't have it calibrated. So like these are the calibration parameters basically up here that mattered for this setup. Uh, and Regina hates calibrating. She doesn't want to do it. And so let's do it in the algorithm. So instead of just optimizing for X, we're gonna optimize for X and jointly optimize for theta, which is the calibration parameters. So now our A matrix is actually parameterized by these theta calibration parameters that we can also solve for. And particularly if we have 110% more data collected than we need to reconstruct, then we have some room there to use that information to solve both for X and for theta. And we can impose a lot of constraints on those calibration parameters. 
for example, the LED positions are always close to what they should be. So we can force them to be like pretty close to what they, we thought they were. Um, here's an example where this, to show that, so the raw image that we constructed, we covered phase and here's the aberrations, this is the, the wave front and the pupil plane. If you go to a different part of the field of view, you get a different aberration. And since we're doing this all patch by patch, it's no problem to do these space varying aberrations and then digitally correct them. All right, so last is that we can do all of this in 3D, that when you illuminate from different angles, you not only shift the Fourier space, but if your sample is 3D and thick, you're actually projecting through the sample in different ways, much like tomography. You can think about putting this all into 3D. Um, you can treat the whole 3D problem like a giant neural network. So it has all the problems of a giant neural network. Um, we don't know when it's always, when it's going to work, but it's pretty, you can start to study it heuristically and figure out when it will work. It basically works if you have enough redundancy and diversity in your data. And one thing that's super cool is that it accounts for multiple scattering. That uh, normally when people do these 3D refractive index measurements, they would make some assumption on scattering, like single scattering. So light only bounces once through the sample. Um, if you wanna account for multiple scattering, you can just treat the sample as if it were a, a bunch of 2D slices and there's scattering happening between the slices, which means light can bounce multiple times. So we put that all into the forward model. So this is a combination of the multi-layer method and this born single scattering method together. And we put all of this into our forward model and so we can then hope that the inverse problem can solve for, for samples with multiple scattering. So I just want to show you, this is our, this is a cell and I'm illuminating it with, from different angles that are spiraling outwards. And this is just the Fourier transform of the captured image. And like something really obvious going on here, right? These two circles. And basically, the center point of one of these circles is the illumination, it tells you what the illumination angle is. So there's how you can self calibrate what the illumination angle is, like fit this to a circle, find the center of it. That's your actual illumination angle, even if it wasn't exactly correct. The second circle is just because there's a complex conjugate, you take absolute value squared. So, you, so that's like out of correlation in Fourier space. Okay, so if we use the single scattering, uh, forward model in our inverse problem, then we get this result. If we use the multiple scattering forward model, we get this result. And for this sample, uh, it doesn't have a lot of multiple scattering. So it's just a single cell on a Petri dish. And these two circles are actually a hallmark of single scattering. All of the, all of the information should stay within the circles if there's only single scattering. So this sample is fairly single scattering, clear two circles, these two results are basically the same. So this is the central slice of the 3D reconstruction given these two forward models. Um, if I take a sample that has more multiple scattering, you can actually see it looks more speckly here. Then it's Fourier transform obviously has some information outside those two circles. It can't get there except through multiple scattering. So there's definitely some multiple scattering going on here. And now when we use our multiple scattering inverse problem, uh, we get a much nicer result than the single scattering. So this is very low, high pass filtery. And if we do even more scattering, we really lose the two circles altogether and we get an even bigger difference between here. And these images are much more correct. So now we can look at samples like this uh, C. elegans where we can actually image inside this worm. This is the central slice of the 3D reconstruction. The whole reconstruction is about 15 gigapixels here. And this is something we never would have been able to image this stuff before because the sample itself is scattering the light. Um, and that, that means there's a lot of multiple scattering going on, but because we can digitally undo it, then we can now actually like visualize the inside of this sample where otherwise it would have just been blurry. Um, and so this is the end of my talk. And I just wanna stress some of our key themes around reproducibility and with computational imaging. I say that reproducibility doesn't just mean putting your code online for free. It means designing the system to be accessible. So off the shelf hardware, cheap, simple, easy to build, easy to align, easy to do the reconstruction. We're not quite there yet in some cases, but this is like where we're going and what we're trying to do. And uh, to that end, we're always very eager to collaborate with people who wanna try these methods. Um, uh, and I should say that we actually have this little company that sells 
fancier LED arrays that just click into the condenser aperture of your microscope uh, because we want people to be able to use them easier. And this is not something you would uh, get made on your own. So that's the end. Very happy to take any questions. I'd like to thank my students who did all of the work and all of our collaborators and my anti-collaborator who's in the hotel room, probably doing this to my sister right now. So happy to take questions. <laughs>